of marriage underwent considerable change in the 16th century. The medieval carriage was heavy, solid, and lacked any suspension, so that it was also very uncomfortable for long journeys and apt to break down if the going got rough. The invention of the suspended coach body in Hungary in the late 15th century and its subsequent spread across Europe meant that the carriage actually became something that one could enjoy riding in, not just something to be used out of necessity. And you can see the parallels with marriage there. But the idea of marriage was also changing, most significantly with the notion of companionate marriage, or the idea that husband and wife were a team. The husband was team leader, but they were definitely a team, and mutual love and esteem became things that were advocated as necessary to a, success, to a successful marriage. It is also important to remember that when we are speaking of early modern households, we are not dealing with a nuclear family of husband, wife, and 2.4 children. The early modern household was larger and more complex. It would generally include servants and might also include elderly relatives, children by previous marriages, nieces or nephews, apprentices and journeymen. It is generally true to say that Elizabethan society was hierarchical and patriarchal. Patriarchy is a word that is used a lot in modern political rhetoric as somehow synonymous with a universal oppression of all who are not male. So it might be worth noting then what the term really means historically. A form of social organization in which the father or oldest male is the head of the family and descent and relationship are reckoned through the male line and then by extension government or rule by a man or men. It is in the first place a description of a society's way of organizing itself domestically and in terms of inheritance. In 16th century England, as in Western Europe in general, the husband was the head of the household because of the passage in Genesis in which God tells Eve that thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. What sometimes gets overlooked when one speaks of the Elizabethan household as hierarchical and patriarchal is that the wife is pretty high up in the household hierarchy. It is not the case, for instance, that as a woman she is subservient to men in general though it is true that as a wife she is subservient to her husband. The Elizabethan hierarchy, like the medi medieval one, was public and obvious, although it was rapidly becoming more complex. Everyone had a place in society, and although society was becoming more mobile, everyone knew their place, which was usually clearly signaled by costume, title, mode of address, and occupation. Virtually everyone in society would be both above and below someone else in the so on the social scale. Once you knew who someone was, you knew how you should behave towards them. For the wife, there was a clear place in the household and in society. She was, on a daily basis, in command of members of the household other than her husband. The care and discipline of young children was directly her responsibility, and she would have had authority over servants and apprentices, many of whom would still be no more than adolescent, but also adult servants and journeymen. She would often be economically active, either working with her husband in the family business, which she could continue to run as a widow if necessary, or at the lower levels of society working as an alewife or spinster. Upper class wives had less economic freedom, but would often be in command of large households when their husbands were absent. This could involve the administration of large estates, the dealing out of justice, and even the defense of prop the property against armed invaders. This was the case in the medieval household as well, of course, and at many other periods in history, including our own, but the rising urbanization of the 16th century meant that more and more households were of the middling sort, as they called, not large enough to be run by a delegated male steward, with the wife largely uninvolved, but still large enough to involve several adult or adolescent unrelated dependents. With all this to consider, the idea that love was a major feature of marriage or a necessary preliminary to it was in the medieval period less important than what the wife brought to the marriage. Wealth, land, fertility, estate management skills, knowledge of household medicine, and so forth. The romances focused on her golden hair and gentle heart, but in real life her general good health and stamina were probably greater considerations. Of course, there's still the problem of the unmarried woman. The definition of patriarchy is clearly connected to the household and the ensuring of legitimate lines of inheritance. It only expands from this primary meaning to mean government or rule by ma a man or men. In the late 16th century, this presented another problem. What do you do when all patriarchal attempts to secure a male heir, and Henry VIII worked pretty hard at it, 
have nevertheless resulted in a woman as the head of government. Worse yet, an intelligent autocratic woman, and worst of all, an unmarried woman. The Ditchley portrait, painted in 1592, shows Elizabeth I very firmly in command, her feet on the map of England, the storms behind her, and fair weather ahead. It is also one of the few portraits of Elizabeth that make her look anything near her real age, which was nearly 60 at the time. Compare the Armada portrait, painted in 1588, so four years before, or better yet, the Rainbow portrait, painted eight years later in 1600. That does not look like a woman in her mid-60s. Um, I mention Elizabeth I at this point because almost all the plays I will be discussing come from the last decade of her reign, and her attitude towards plays and the role of women in plays is important. Conventionally, comedies end in marriages, and the role of the main female character is to marry the hero after some suitable obstacle has been overcome, and possibly after her chastity has been threatened in some way, and she has been rescued by the hero. An unmarried woman, ideally, should be seen only from a respectful distance and not heard at all. Not surprisingly, Elizabeth found this emphasis on marriage dull, and in the early part of her reign, when plays were being aimed at persuading her to marry, rather irritating, as the Spanish ambassador noted in 1567. The hatred that this queen has of marriage is most strange. They represented a comedy before her last night until nearly one in the morning, which ended in a marriage, and the queen, as she told me herself, expressed her dislike of the woman's part. Actually, Elizabeth's Ma hatred of marriage is not that strange, given that her father chopped off her mother's head when she was three and her stepmother's when she was eight. Her final stepmother, Catherine Parr, after surviving marriage to Henry VIII, subsequently died in childbirth after marrying Sir Thomas Seymour. All this could give one a rather negative view of marriage and the implications of the woman's part in traditional romantic comedy. The background of Shakespeare's comedies then consisted of a patriarchal society which assumed that the role of woman was, a woman was to be modest, chaste, and preferably silent, to marry and to produce legitimate heirs for her husband. At the same time, that society was ruled by a strong-minded queen who refused to marry or even to name her heir. Against this background, Shakespeare was creating some of his greatest comedies, and his comedies addressed some of the anxieties that the, that, that social background produced. I want to begin today with one of his most controversial plays, The Taming of the Shrew. This is a play that attracts extreme responses and extreme interpretations even today. It has been called anti-feminist and deeply misogynistic. The debate over whether it should be performed or whether it should be actively banned is still continuing. The Taming of Katharina has been performed as violent knockabout farce and as cold-blooded psychological torture. Her final speech, the longest in the play, has been performed as a simple ventriloquism of Petruccio as puppet master, as a zombie-like recitation by a patient in an asylum, and as an ironic expression of Katharina's ability to manage her man. All of these interpretations are possible, and how well they work on stage will depend on the skill of the performers, the quality of the director, and the attitudes of the audience. And the last of these is not the least. With this play in particular, people tend to make up their minds beforehand. Today, I want to look at the source stories behind the play and to consider the wooing and taming of Katharina in the context of the time in which it was written. I will also look at the other wooing story in the play, that of Bianca and Lucencio. I should point out that there is some dispute about the date of the taming of the shrew. It could be as early as 1592 or as late as 1609, 1610. I'm treating it as an Elizabethan rather than a Jacobean play for the purposes of this lecture, but my general argument is not affected by it. I just, it's a way of getting it into the lecture. So there are two wooing stories in The Taming of the Shrew, and they draw on different sources. There is the romantic story of the lover, Lucencio, who woos his beloved, Bianca, in disguise and persuades her to elope. This draws on the romance tradition and more directly on George Gascoigne's play, Supposes, which has a number of mistaken identities in it. The other story tells of a shrew, Katharina, who is married and subsequently tamed by Petruccio. This draws on popular folk tales, and its more immediate source is probably the anonymous, a merry jest of a shrewd and cursed wife lapped in a moral skin for her good behavior, from about 1580. It's important to remember that there are two wooings and two heroines in the play, because they offer us two alternatives of female behavior. At first glance, Katharina and Bianca would seem to be divided into the good daughter and the bad daughter. Bianca, the good daughter, is beautiful, obedient, and quiet. Katharina is a shrew, a bad daughter, because she answers back. 
As a result of this, she is making it difficult for her father to find her husband. How do we know Catherine is a shrew? Well, everyone says so. In fact, they say it not only to each other, but they say it to her as well. When we first see her, her father has just told Grimio and Hortensio, suitors to Bianca, that they cannot marry Bianca until Catherine has found a husband. As the elder sister, it is expected that she will marry first, and it would be humiliating for her if she did not. Baptista, her father, then tells the suitors that either of them can court Catherine if they want. Their response is, to say the least, insensitive, with Catherine standing right there, and indeed, they insult her directly. To cart her, rather. She's too rough for me. There, there, Hortensio, will you any wife? And Catherine is standing in the middle here, saying, I pray you, sir, is it your will to make a stale of me amongst these mates? Mates, mate? How mean you that? No mates for you, unless you were of gentler, milder mold. Catherine's use of stale here has several layers of meaning. The primary one is that of a laughing stock, but it also has implications of a decoy and of a prostitute, as well as imagery drawn from the, from the game of chess. Catherine is protesting, with justification, that her father is permitting these men to treat her as if she was a common prostitute. Receiving no support from her father, she can only lash out verbally at Hortensio, threatening to comb your noddle with a three-legged stool. Lucencio and Tranio, who have been watching this exchange, see Catherine as stark mad or wonderful forward. But Bianca's silence appears to Lucencio as maid's mild behavior and sobriety. Bianca wins by silence. Katharina, who perhaps knows her a little better, calls her a pretty pet, in other words, daddy's favorite, and suggests that Bianca's perfectly capable of turning on the tears when it suits her. The fact that Baptista speaks lovingly to Bianca, and let it not displease thee, good Bianca, for I will love thee ne'er the less, my girl, and dismissively to Katharina, Katharina, you may stay, for I have more to commune with Bianca, does give the impression that Katharina's jealousy isn't entirely without cause. Unlike the shrew in the ballad source of the taming, who has a supportive and shrewish mother, Katharina is isolated in the Minola household. She is a liability to her father, who is going to have to pay out a considerable dowry to get rid of her. She is, by being unmarried, threatening or at least delaying her sister's marriage prospects. Nobody wants her. Nobody values her. She is even going to cost Bianca's suitors money, as they will have to bribe someone to woo her, wed her, and bed her, and rid the house of her. Worst of all, by reacting to the way others treat her, she is risking her whole future. For a woman in the late 16th century, marriage was the only career option, or at least the only respectable one. And failure to get a husband was not just a worldly failure. When in Act Two, Scene One, Katharina accuses her father of favoritism, she makes reference to the proverbial idea that old maids would lead apes in or into hell because they had no children to lead into heaven. What, will you not suffer me? Nay, now I see, she is your treasure, she must have a husband. I must dance barefoot on her wedding day and for your love to her lead apes in hell. To dance barefoot became proverbial for becoming an old maid, as an elder unmarried sister was supposed to dance barefoot or alternatively, alternatively in yellow stockings to avert bad luck and catch a husband. The problem with an old maid is that she is potentially not under the control of any particular man. The expected pattern was that a woman would pass from her father's authority to her husband's. In this way, she was under male protection and control without interruption. The system of patriarchy was focused on ensuring the legitimate succession of land and property through the male line. This means that women's sexual behavior had to be controlled, as there was no objective way of determining who the child's father was. Female virtue, female identity even, was therefore defined primarily in terms of sexual virtue. This can be seen in the kind of insults that turn up in slander cases. If you want to slander a man, you attack his social standing, calling him, for instance, rogue or villain, his honesty, thief, false villain, or the sexual probity of his wife, cuckold, or his mother, bastard or son of a whore, which, of course, also affects his social standing. For a woman, it is simpler. The insults, generally variations on a theme of whore, all imply sexual promiscuity. And a subset of this are the insults of that, that focus on verbal promiscuity, calling her a scold or a shrew. Scolds and shrews, incidentally, could originally be either male or female, but it became increasingly seen as a feminine term. Scolding was also legally punishable offense, at least by the early 17th century. Punishments included the brank or scold's bridle, such as this one, the 16th century Scottish one, where you have a tang that goes into the mouth and it was a, completely encased. 
Um, so both sort of pain and humiliation. Katharina's position then is pretty precarious at this stage of the play. Her whole future is in jeopardy. No one values Katharina. When Petruccio, a few lines after the ones I quoted a couple of minutes ago, first meets Baptista and asks him, pray, have you not a daughter called Katharina, fair and virtuous? Baptista replies cautiously, I have a daughter, sir, called Katharina. Um, Tranio, disguised as Lucentio, uses the same formula, fair and virtuous, to describe Bianca about 50 lines later. No one quibbles at that. Katharina's perceived shrewishness, however, is taken to cast doubt on both her virtue and her beauty. It has been pointed out that really Katharina is a conformist, not a rebel. She wants to get married like other girls do. It's Bianca, after all, who elopes and marries without her father's permission. Katharina is the one holding out for the proper traditional way of doing things, including the elder daughter marrying first. Let's look for a moment at Petruccio. If we see Katharina as a victim, then Petruccio has to be seen as her main oppressor. He is further vilified as a fortune hunter only after her money, and by implication offering nothing in return. This is not quite the case. Petruccio sums up his attitude in Act 2, Scene 1 as unashamedly looking for a rich wife, but he is not a pauper or a con artist. Antonio, my father, is deceased, and I have thrust myself into this maze, happily to wive and thrive as best I may. Crowns in my purse have I, and goods at home, and so am come abroad to see the world. Wealth is the burden of my wooing dance. I come to wive it wealthily in Padua, Padua if wealthily, then happily in Padua. So he doesn't mind all the negative qualities in the wife. He's not expecting um, anything. Not the romantic hero who falls in love with a woman at first sight without having exchanged a single word with her. Not Lucentio, in fact. But also not expecting perfection in a wife on the basis of no other criteria than that she is pretty and doesn't say much. Petruccio is at least more honest in his approach. He announces in his intention from the first and arranges with the Baptiste and the man who has authority over Katharina for Katharina's dowry. This may seem mercenary to us, but the purpose of the arrangement between the two men is to protect and provide for Katharina. Baptista puts up the promise that Katharina will get half his property. She and Bianca will be co-heiresses, as was customary when they were only daughters. And Petruccio will also get 20,000 crowns, a very substantial sum at the time. Petruccio is not simply grabbing all he can get. He voluntarily assures Baptista that, for that dowry, I'll assure her of her widowhood, be it that she survive me, in all my lands and leases whatsoever. This would mean that Katharina, if she outlived Petruccio, would be both, both wealthy and independent. She would have control over her own property. This was not automatic in the case of widowhood, and many widows found themselves with only a life interest in their husband's property and unable to exercise any control over it. Frequently, they had to take their husband's male relatives, including at time their own sons, to court to get the money for their maintenance. The marriage settlement is a generous one on both sides, even if it is made between the two men without consulting Katharina. Lucentio, on the other hand, as a romantic hero, has to bypass Bianca's father. Never mind that he sends his, father, his servant in disguise to negotiate with Baptista on his behalf. With Bianca, of course, Baptista is in a seller's market. He can use her marriage as a means of increasing the family wealth rather than having to pay to get rid of her, as he does with Katharina. Lucentio is not poor, or at least he has a rich father. Tranio and Grimio enter into a bidding war for Bianca in Act Two, Scene One, and the only question that Baptista has is whether Lucentio's father will, in fact, endorse the rather extravagant offers of his supposed son, that his supposed son has made on his behalf. Grimio doubts it. An old Italian fox is not so kind, my boy. This, of course, involves Lucentio and Tranio in further lies and deceptions, and the solution is, in the end, for Lucentio and Bianca to marry secretly and ask pardon afterwards. They are forgiven, of course, and the real Vincenzo turns up and does agree to satisfy Baptiste about the marriage settlements. But it is all, when you come right down to it, rather underhand, and offers us another aspect of the perceived dangers of women. The noisy ones are shrews, and the quiet ones are sneaky. What can we say, then, about the taming of Katharina? Everyone says over and over again, and in her presence, that she is cursed, a shrew, a devil, a fiend of hell. No one is interested in her side of the story, and it's clear in Act 2, Scene 1, when she has tied Bianca's hands, that Katharina can't articulate her own sense of frustration. Her silence flouts me, and I'll be revenged is the only explanation she can offer for her bad behavior. 
She is badly behaved, of that there is, can, is no doubt. What she is not is the bad sister folktale, or even the shrew of the ballad source, whose ambition is to control her husband. Even in the folktale version of the ballad, the shrew's mother advises the prospective husband that listening to his wife would be a wise choice. In women, sometime great wisdom is, and in men full little is, it is often seen. But she is wise without a miss, from a young child up she hath so been. Therefore to her thou must audience give, for thine own profit when she doth speak. And then shalt thou in quiet live, and much strife thus shalt thou break. This actually seems very good advice. Katharina has no mother to point this out to Petruchio, but in the wooing scene he seems to have worked it out for himself. His policy, he informs us, will be to behave as if Katharina is reacting to him in the way that he wants her to. He will, in effect, create a new role for her and pretend that she is playing it. Say that she rail, why then, I'll tell her plain, she sings as sweetly as a nightingale. Say that she frown, I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses news, newly washed with dew. Say she be mute and will not speak a word, then I'll commend her volub volubility. And say she uttereth piercing eloquence. If she do bid me pack, I'll give her thanks as though she bid me stay by her a week. If she deny to wed, I'll crave the day when I shall ask the bands and when be married. He intends, in other words, to ignore her bad behavior, but also at the same time to remind her of good behavior by commending her for it. Notice that the one thing he doesn't plan to commend her for is silence. For Lucentio, Bianca's silence was an indication of her mild behavior and sobriety. And Katharina has been seen as a shrew largely because she refuses to be silent. Petruchio offers Katharina another opportunity. Her speech can become piercing eloquence. In fact, Petruchio doesn't really follow his plan. The dialogue becomes an exchange of witty insults and innuendos, quite different from the kind of verbal attacks Katharina has been used to. But first, he offers her a different version of what people might be saying about her. When she says, he calls her Kate, and she says, no, they call me Catherine that do speak of me. She says, you lie in faith. For you are called plain Kate, and bonny Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed. But Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates. And therefore, Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation, hearing thy mildness, pra mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Although Petruchio has earlier claimed that he would marry Katharina no matter what she was like, it is clear that he is actually attracted to her, and his willingness to marry her now is an act of desire to do so. The question to it has to be asked, why does she agree? She scolds her father for trying to marry her to one half lunatic, a madcap, madcap ruffian, and a swearing jack. But when the wedding day arrives and Petruchio doesn't, at least not until the last moment, she doesn't see this as an escape. I must forsooth be forced to give my hand, opposed against my heart, unto a mad-brained Rudesby full of spleen, who wooed in haste and means to wed at leisure. I told you I he was a frantic fool, hiding his bitter jests and blunt behavior. And to be noted for a merry man, he'll woo a thousand, point the day of marriage, make feast, invite friends, and proclaim the bands, yet never means to wed where he hath wooed. Now must the world point at poor Catherine and say, lo, there is mad Petruchio's wife. If it would please him, come and marry her. There are two significant things we learn about Katharina. In the first place, she does want to get married. Not surprising, given that failure to marry is tantamount to failure as a woman and loss of social identity. In the second place, she is concerned, even morbidly so, about how she is seen by others. When it looks as if Katharina will be jilted at the altar, the onstage sympathy for once is with her. It is now Petruchio's behavior that is socially unacceptable. He has become the shrew. His behavior at the wedding is so appalling that Grimio, not the most sensitive individual, tells us that he came thence for very shame at seeing Petruchio behave so badly and offers the opinion that Katharina will find that she's a lamb, a dove, a fool to him. Petruchio offers an overblown, exaggerated version of both patriarchal authority and romantic stereotypes. He misquotes the Tenth Commandment. She is my goods, my chattels, she is my house, my household stuff, my field, my barn, my horse, my ox, my ass, my anything. He threatens to sue anyone who tries to stop him and pretends that he and Grumio are rescuing Katharina from thieves in typical romance style. I'll bring my action on the proudest he that stops my way in Padua. Grumio, draw forth thy weapon. We are beset with thieves. Rescue thy mistress if thou be a man. Fear not, sweet wench, they shall not touch thee, Kate. I'll buckler thee against a million. Bianca's conclusion that Katharina, being mad herself, is madly mated, 
seems to sum up the general attitude with the addition from Grimio that, I warrant you, Petruchio is cated. Petruchio's extreme performance of the patriarchal husband serves to point out the system's problems. The actual taming of the shrew takes place after the wedding. The taming is, of course, what most bothers modern audience. So it is important to look at what Petruchio actually does and what he doesn't do in, this, in the taming process. The most important thing that he doesn't do is the one that the original audience would almost certainly have expected him to do, and that is beat Katharina. In the source ballad, despite promising his mother-in-law that he would not beat his wife, the husband, having been denied food and drink by his wife after she has complained of his behavior on the wedding night, beats her until she is bloody and then ties her up in a salted horse hide. The beating of the shrewish wife, often while pretending to beat something else in order to avoid breaking a promise, is a feature of shrew taming tales. But Petruchio does not beat Katharina. Although wife beating was not illegal in Elizabethan period, it was increasingly becoming socially unacceptable. Henry Smith, in his 1593 sermon, A Preparative to Marriage, warned husbands against beating their wives, telling them that her cheeks are made for thy lips and not for thy fist. A marginal note sums up the restraint that both husbands and wives would be expected to exercise. Husbands must hold their hands and wives their tongues. Protestant marriage tracts and conduct books, such as William Goff's Of Domestical Duties, Eight Treatises, invade fiercely against wife beating on the grounds that the wife is not sufficiently inferior to the husband to make beating her legitimate. So we're back to the hierarchical thing. She's too high in the hierarchy. Guff admits that forward wives can be a problem, but still insists that they should not be beaten. His suggestion that the shrewish wife be restrained of liberty, denied such things that she most effective, be kept up as it were in hold, has echoes of Petruchio's method. Katharina is denied not only new clothes, but also food and sleep. It has been pointed out with indignation in modern objections to the taming of the shrew that semi-starvation and sleep deprivation are used in modern times as methods of torture and interrogation. This is no doubt true, but it is certainly not true that these would have been considered torture in Shakespeare's day, when the rack could be used as a method of interrogation. What is often overlooked is that making individuals go without food or sleep for prolonged periods is not always used as torture. It is also used to build up an individual's sense of self by, self by initially breaking it down. Army boot camps, for example, or outward bound programs, but by no means limited to those. And for all her outspoken shrewishness, Katharina, at the time of her marriage, distinctly lacks self-confidence. The most obvious parallel to Petruchio's shrew-taming shrew methods for his original audience would be the taming of hawks for falconry. A wild hawk, or haggard, a word also used for an uncontrolled woman, would be kept awake and in the dark for a prolonged period by the falconer, who would also have to keep awake. She would be kept hungry and then fed only by the falconer so that she imprinted on him, relying on him for everything. It was a grueling process for both bird and man. Petruchio is basically applying the same technique to Katharina as he specifically tells us. My falcon now is sharp and passing empty. Until she stoops, she must not be full gorged, for then she never looks upon her lure. Another way I have to man my haggard, to make her come and know her keeper's call. That is, to watch her as we watch these kites that bait and beat and will not be obedient. She ate no meat today, nor none shall eat. Last night she slept not, nor tonight she shall not. As with the meat, some undeserved fault I'll find about the making of the bed. And here I'll fling the pillow, there the bolster, this way the coverlet, another way the sheets. I, and amid this hurly, I intend that all is done in reverent care of her. And in conclusion, she shall watch all night. And if she chance to nod, I'll rail and brawl, and with the clamor keep her still awake. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness, and thus I'll curb her mad and headstrong humor. He that knows better how to tame a shrew, now let him speak. Tis charity to show. The, this method relies, of course, on Petruchio staying awake as well. He has to be very active about it. Katharina does not suffer alone, although she clearly suffers more because she doesn't understand the purpose of it all. The ways in which Shakespeare changes his so story bring the idea of marriage in the play closer to the Protestant marriage ideology of his day, which saw the idea of domination by the husband being replaced by the idea of mutuality within hierarchy, with the husband still as the head of the family, but the wife as clearly second in command. In this respect, it is worth noting that Katharina does take on two traditional and wifely roles even before she's fully tamed. 
In Act 4, Scene 1, Grumio tells his fellow servant, Curtis, about their adventures on the way to Petruchio's house, how Petruchio beat Grumio because Catherina's horse stumbled, and how she waded through the dirt to pluck him off me. Later in the act, when Petruchio strikes the servant for dropping the water they were to wash in, in performance he usually drops it because Petruchio strikes him, Katharina intervenes in an attempt to pacify Petruchio. Patience, I pray you, t'was a fault unwilling. In the household hierarchy, the wife was meant to mediate between the husband at the top and the children and servants below. Mercy is seen as a feminine prerogative and justice as masculine, but both are valued. At the same time, the wife had authority in the household and would also be able to discipline children and servants. It is worth noting that the violence, which in the traditional shoe stories would be applied to the wife, is here displaced to the servants. Earlier in the play, Katharina had broken the head of Hortensio, who is disguised as Lizio, the lute teacher. She had also earlier threatened that she would comb your noddle with a three-legged stool. Both of these are inappropriate violence against her teacher and against her father's guest. But when in Act 4, Scene 3, she beats Grumio for teasing her with promises of beef and mustard, beef without mustard, and, mustard, and finally mustard without beef, she is not breaking any societal boundaries. As wife, she is in charge of the household and should be treated with respect. Petruccio is very careful to insist that all the servants are turned out in their best array to greet her. He is careful that her status should be maintained, but also that she should learn to be worthy of it. When she insists that she will have the new cap because it is what gentle women are wearing, Petruccio replies, when you are gentle, you shall have one too, and not till then. This is less torture and than the kind of remark that, that might be made to a toddler given to tantrums, which it has to be admitted Katharina has been. Petruccio explains the problem to her at the end of the scene. Look, what I speak or do or think to do, you are still crossing it. He needs some cooperation from her, and by the end of the play, of course, he gets it. Possibly the biggest hurdle for modern critics and directors, particularly feminist ones, has been Katharina's final speech. How are we to take it? Does she really mean it? Has she just become a puppet of the patriarchy, parroting the official line on marriage? It has been performed that way in earlier pr productions as Katharina's joyful acceptance of her place in the patriarchy, and in more recent ones as a victim's complete subjection to her tormentor. But it's difficult to see Katharina as completely a victim when one looks at the speech in context. For one thing, that would require us to take her earlier submission in the Sun Moon debate in Act 4, Scene 5, equally literally. Now, here I need the assistance of my charming assistant and uh, husband. Um, <laughs> He's no Richard Burton, but he's, he works cheap, so that's, I'm, and I'm no Elizabeth Taylor. Okay. Good Lord, how bright and goodly shines the moon. The moon? The sun? It is not moonlight now. I say it's the moon that shines so bright. I know it is the sun that shines so bright. Now by my mother's sun, and that's myself, it shall be moon or star or what I list or ere I journey to your father's house. Okay, and at this point, Hortensio, who's with them, basically says, oh, for heaven's sakes, just agree to it with him, because we're never going to get there otherwise. Um, and Katharina finally, the penny drops, and she realizes that she has to play along. Forward, I pray, since we have come so far, and be it moon or sun or what you please, and if you please to call it a rush candle, henceforth I vow it shall be for me. I say it is the moon. I know it is the moon. Nay, then you lie, it is the blessed sun. Then God be blessed, it is the blessed sun. But sun it is not when you say it is not, and the moon changes even as your mind. What you will have it named, even that it is, and so it shall be so for Katharina. Or Catherine, sorry. Katharina is now the one who speaks as if she is humoring a small child. And the changeableness of the moon, proverbially linked with the fickleness of women, is now a feature of Petruccio's mind. Katharina finally understands the rules of the game they are playing, and now she can not only speak her mind, which she did earlier loudly but not clearly, but she can, like a good debater, argue both sides of the question. Like a humanist scholar, she has learned the art of rhetoric and the self-confidence to apply it. Let us look at the final scene. It is Bianca's wedding. Bianca, remember, the younger daughter who was her father's favorite, whose side he always took in any dispute with Katharina, whose silence first attracted Lucentio, who is the model of what a dutiful daughter should be, but who nevertheless ran off and secretly married a man disguised as a servant whom she barely knew. By doing this, she potentially deprived her father of his rights in the dowry negotiations, which might then have had serious consequences for her if her husband had, had died or deserted her. Katharina was denied her own wedding feast earlier by Petruccio's behavior, and Bianca took her place. 
Then there is Hortensio, Petruccio's friend, Catherina's former adversary, who has married a widow, that is, a woman with marital experience who, according to Hortensio at least, has been in love with him for a long time. These are potentially the models of wifehood that Catherina is presented with. And the widow, at least, seems perfectly ready to start the game of cake baiting again. Her remark to Petruccio that he that is giddy thinks the world turns round is gratuitously aimed at Katharina. Rather than fly off the handle and resort to vulgar abuse, Katharina carefully but insistently establishes what exactly the widow meant by that remark. Your husband being troubled with a shrew measures my husband's sorrow by his woe, and now you know my meaning. A very mean meaning. Right, I mean you. And I am mean indeed respecting you. Katharina's put down here is effective, even if, or perhaps particularly because, its meaning is not clear. There may be a play on mean it in the sense of live chastely, widows being suspected of lustful proclivities. Katharina could be saying either that she will not demean herself by paying attention to the widow, or she could be implying that she is a respectable married woman compared to the widow. Their husbands clearly see their, her remark as fighting words, and Petruccio makes it clear that he is backing Kate. For once, someone is on her side. Bianca also gets involved in the banter around the table, but refuses to respond to Petruccio's invitation to exchange a bitter jest or two, bitter here in the sense of shrewd or sharp, without any implied ill nature. Rather than risk losing a battle of wits, Bianca takes the other women off stage. When, later in the scene, Catherine has demonstrated her obedience to Petruccio by throwing her cap underfoot, Bianca castigates it as foolish duty. Lucencio points out rather sourly that the wisdom of your duty, fair Bianca, hath cost me a hundred crowns since supper time. But she simply retorts, the more fool you for laying on my duty. In the close analogue of the Taming of the Shrew, confusingly called the Taming of a Shrew, Polydor, the Lucentio character, says outright to Amelia, the Bianca character, I say thou art a shrew, to which she replies, that's better than a sheep. Maybe it is. The real question, however, is not which is better, but are these our only alternatives? Does Katharina, in order to survive, simply cease resisting the patriarchal hierarchical notion of marriage and become a sheep, a doormat? Or is Shakespeare presenting us with a different view of marriage? On stage, what we see is a competition, with money involved, between three men. It begins with the men trying to carry over the earlier jibes at Katharina's shrewish, shrewishness to Petruccio, implying that he is a henpecked husband. When Baptista says seriously that Petruccio's wife is the veriest shrew of all, Petruccio equally seriously defends her by proposing that they find out which wife is most obedient. He doesn't have to. He could join in the fellowship by complaining about his shrewish wife, but he doesn't. You're familiar with the result. Bianca says she can't come, Widow says she won't come, and then Katharina does come and then fetches the other two. Let's speculate for a minute about what was happening in the offstage world of the play. Katharina tells us that Bianca and the widow sit conferring by the parlor fire. They're sitting conferring with each other. Katharina is not part of their little group. And I do wonder if they are ganging up on Katharina. Perhaps the kind of catty remarks that the widow made on stage have conti continued off stage. Perhaps they just whisper together, look at Katharina, and giggle. Um, whatever anyone has said about Katharina, no one has ever called her stupid. So when the messenger comes first for Bianca, and then the widow, Katharina will clearly know that something is up. And if something is up, then very likely Petruccio is up to something. It wouldn't be hard for her to work out that this is another test and that obedience is involved. Also, she is now in a position where she is not alone against the world. She and Petruccio can act as a team. She doesn't have to worry anymore about what other people might think. When Petruccio instructs her to tell these headstrong women what duty they do owe their lords and husbands, he also tells her to begin with the widow. And that must have been very satisfying for her. <laughs> Katharina's final speech is the longest single speech in the play. The ideal of the silent, modest woman, Bianca, is replaced by Katharina, the woman who is a skilled rhetorician who can be both ironic and serious. Ironic because she is addressing her words to the widow, and she, we, and everyone else know that they are not going to make an iota of difference in that direction. Serious because she puts forward an ideal of marriage found in the Protestant marriage tracts of Shakespeare's day. Patriarchal and hierarchical, yes, but this is a patriarchal and hierarchical society, and marriage is presented as a microcosm of that society. 
The husband is thy head, thy sovereign, and the wife owes the same duty to her husband as the subject owes to the prince, who, remember, at this time was Elizabeth I. The men in the audience are therefore in the same relationship to the queen as Katharina is to Petruchio. Katharina presents a marriage that is a mutual contract. The husband undertakes hardships to provide for his wife, who can remain secure and safe at home. In return, she provides love, fair looks, and true obedience. Rather than put forward a, the more traditional argument that women are condemned to their inferior status because Eve ate the apple, Katharina treats it more as a matter of specialization. Men are more suited to physical risk and labor, particularly in the context of a male-dominated society where most occupations are simply not open to women. Katharina, Katharina reminds the other women that she is not a sheep. She is an intelligent, strong-willed woman. Come, come, you froward and unable worms. My mind hath been as high as one of yours. My heart is great, my reason happily more to band and bandy word for word and frown for frown. Ultimately, she says, she finds quarreling unproductive and unsatisfactory. She probably gets a lot more enjoyment out of being allowed to call Bianca and the widow froward and unable worms. She finishes by echoing an old marriage custom beginning to die out in the late 16th century. So again, we see Katharina as the traditionalist. Um, in token of, her accept of the wife placing her hand under her husband's foot in the marriage ceremony, in token of her acceptance of the marital hierarchy. This is more than Petruchio expected of her. Earlier, he predicted that her willingness to obey him in swinging the other two women from the, from the parlor foretold a happy marriage. Marry, peace it bodes, and love, and quiet life, and awful rule, and right supremacy, and to be short, what not, but sweet and happy. Baptiste is so overcome at this point that he gives Petruchio another 20,000 crowns. Catherine is so very different from what she was before that she seems another daughter. The play could have ended happily before Katharina's final speech, but it doesn't. Before Katharina's speech, Petruchio is the one controlling the action, but I'm not sure that he still is at the end of it. His response to her offer of her hand under his foot seems slightly overwhelmed. Why, there's a wench. Come on and kiss me, Kate. This will probably always be a play that evokes many and varied reactions, dramatically a good sign, and people will probably always judge it according to the ideas they bring to the play. Katharina and Petruccio are both, at various points in the play, shrewish in their behavior. But by the end of the play, they seem to be the one couple whose marriage is likely to work well. Bianca, the romantic heroine of the standard comedy plot, who should be having the happy ever after ending, seems to lose her romantic glamour once she is married. Baptista finally recognizes that both his daughters have value, and Petruccio and Katharina are considerably, considerably richer as a result. Katharina has found her voice and her place in the world, even if it is not our world, which even if it is not our world, is still a realistic world in Shakespeare's time. Um, now tomorrow, we move into the realm of Fairyland for a bit and discuss the romantic complications of a more traditional type in the Midsummer Night's Dream, but I've been asked to put it to you that um, because of my being sick yesterday, we're sort of having a bit of problems with um, whether we'll get a venue for Saturday, and the um, suggestion is, but would you rather that I just dropped one of the lectures and just made this a four-lecture course? Um, what would suit you best? Four lectures? OK. Uh, then I think possibly Midsummer Night's Dream may be the one to drop. Um, but I'll have a look at it. So it may not be Midsummer Night's Dream tomorrow. So we've got, I don't want to drop much ado about nothing, because that's the play, that's, being, that's the film. Sorry? Why is that? Why not? OK. OK. Well, what we've got is what's left is Midsummer Night's Dream, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, and Twelfth Night. So which one do you want to sacrifice? No. <laughs> I had a funny feeling we'd have this problem, yes. That's the other option. I, look, I'll have a look at things at home and see if I can condense a bit um, and try and smush it through a few of them together. It won't be, you know, won't be as good as I had hoped, but I think I can probably jiggle it a bit and we'll try and do it in four. You're going to have to put up with me talking very fast, though. Okay. <laughs>
What's it? Um, we can certainly run into the question time a little bit, I think. Um, and, and if you want to come here earlier, I will, I'm willing to start earlier. So if we can try and... Yeah. Sorry? If, I, if, if everybody tries to get here for nine, shall we start then? And I'll just, and I'll just go as fast as I can and get through as much as I can. But there, um, I think that there is some overlap and I could just sort of get... And, I know, I know, but I tend to do that when I get when I get agitated about things. I think what I'll have to do is cut some of the quotations a little bit. And um, if everybody if everybody's willing to come at nine o'clock, and then we can sort of jiggle it to ten. We can, we'll also we can also go until quarter past ten. We'll see how things go with tomorrow. Um, I'm not greatly bothered if people walk in, in in the middle of a lecture, so it's not going to um, be disruptive, and I won't stop the whole thing if people walk in. Um, but we'll see how many people we have tomorrow at nine o'clock, and if we if everybody's just sitting here and I'm standing here, then we'll just get going, um, and we'll push it into the into the question period as well, and we should be able to to fit an extra. Yeah, that's usually we're supposed to allow 15 minutes for questions. That's what it is. Which, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I would like to know what you think of the other questions. Yeah. 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 I'm not an, not an expert on that. Right? Which, one, which, which interpretation are you referring to? Yes. Are we on at 9 o'clock? If people are willing to come for nine o'clock, I think that would be that would be helpful. Um, and if you know anybody who's not here today and you want to tell them, there's a hand at the, every. Sorry, there was a hand at the back. Sorry. Well, I think, th yeah. The question is, how did Katharina get that way? You know, what, we have no idea, no information about her mother. Um, and one thing that I'm thinking of, is how much older is Katharina than Bianca? Because there's a scene where, where, where she's got Bianca tied up and she's saying, oh, tell me which of your, your suitors you want, you love best, and, and she's teasing her. Um, and Bianca's saying, oh, no, no, I, I, I know my duty to my elders. I will do what you tell you. Just tell me what you want, and I'll do it, because I know, I know my duty to my elders. Now, if Bianca is 10 years younger um, than Katharina, then a statement about her duty to her elders is quite different than if she's only a year or two younger. Because that can come across as Bianca saying, well, you're so old, you know, and I'm, I've got all these lovers, and you're, you're so old. So I think that... Bianca was always daddy's favorite, and Katharina was always the one that had to be responsible. And, you know, and because she's so intelligent, and because she's so frustrated, um, her behavior becomes bad. You know, that she's, you know, she's, it's the classic sibling rivalry. Here's someone who's you know, been displaced. Possibly um, their mother died when Bianca was born. So you've got this, here's this new loud um, thing that has taken away your mummy, and your daddy spends all his time with that. And so it, psychologically, it's not, un, not implausible that um, her behavior, but she also very much is very sensitive about what other people think. She's always worrying. And one of the bits I didn't include was when just before they get to Baptista's house the last time, Petruccio says, you know, kiss me, Kate. And she's saying, no, not here in public. And he said, are you ashamed of me? And she's, no, I'm ashamed of you. I'm ashamed to kiss. You know, and he said, well, off we go back home again. She said, okay, fine, fine. Because, and she has to learn to stop being so hypersensitive about what other people will see. Because most of the other people, they don't matter. It's what... Petruccio and she are working out their own relationship. So, 
Any other questions? It's not really a question, but it does strike me he drew quite a lot on um, Paul's letter to, I think, the Ephesians about the role of husbands and wives. Mm. Although the King James Version obviously hadn't been printed at that time, there were translations. There were definitely translations, yes. Of the Bible. Yeah. And picking up on that, I'm sure Shakespeare would have been aware of some of these, and picking up on this would have been probably a bit of a lodestone. Yes, I mean, they would have been, the English Bible was in every church and they would have been read out, so um, it would have been familiar. And the ideas, yes, you're right, come um, this idea of a woman keeping silence in public. So silence was very. Except, but it also the role of the man towards the woman. Yes. The yeah. As well, but the, whilst the man is the boss, he has got to care for him. That's right, that it, that it is. That it's a two way thing. Two way thing, yeah. Yes, yeah. And that would have been the standard marriage service at the time. And the older service said she had to be bonny and buxom in bed and at board. We have no evidence of her seeing it or no knowledge of what, um, what she thought of it. I mean, Oh, they, they, were, they were having, I mean, not so much the Shakespearean plays, but a lot of other plays that were just sort of like, here's a play that's, here's a queen, she's getting married, she needs to get married, they say, you know, Gorboduck was, was um, the whole thing is about, let's get the queen married off. And, you know, it'd be really rather irritating. <laughs> um, but as I say, Taming the Shrew might even not be Elizabethan, but um, I wanted to get it in, so I treated it as Elizabethan, because it could be. Maybe not. Um, anything else? Okay, well then I will see you tomorrow. Bye.